So the salient points which we discussed in the last class, uh, the salient points which we discussed is that the first that Swamiji pointed out, the line we will read out, which was very, very important, that though karma means, in a sense, the actions which we are doing now for which we are going to yield results in the future, that's in one sense karma. And in another sense, the karma is the actions which we have done in the past for which we are just, uh, which we are accruing the results at present. So in these two sense, the word karma is used. At the very beginning, Swami Vivekananda's, this line is very important. But in karma yoga, we have simply to do with the word karma as meaning work. It's instead of having that fatalistic attitude that I at present am suffering because of the consequences of something which I have done in the past, that makes us inoperative. We just think that I have to go through all these experiences because something I have done in the past for which uh, I have to, I'm bound to bear with the result. But Swami Vivekananda some, in some other lecture have mentioned very interestingly that if karma means that the effect of action, then yes, what I've done in the past, for that I have to accrue the result in the present. That's true. But it's also true what I do in the present for which I will reap the result in future. So what has been done cannot be undone. So in this life, what experiences we are going, going through, yes, it's true that for our past, most probably to a certain extent, to a great extent, not everything, because there is something called collective karma for which also we suffer. And sometimes it's beyond our hand. Apart from that, there are various other factors in life for which my individual karma is the result. And I have to go through all of them. But instead of having that fatalistic attitude that there is nothing to be done, I should always be aware of the fact that in irrespective of the present situation, if I try to just take the best advantage of the present situation and try to be proactive in all possible ways in the present, that is going to yield the result in future. And for that, I have total control over the present. In our life, we should always remember, we have no control over the past. What is done, we cannot undo it. Life has no replay button. I just cannot go back and just edit it. There is no replay button. What is done cannot be undone. And again, I have no control over the future. I am, the future is very unpredictable. I don't know that what is going to happen tomorrow. But as a human being, I have full control over the present. In the present moment, it's my choice what to do, what not to do, what to do in a different way. Kartum, akartum, anyatha kartum. And that I decide, how will I recourse to the action in the present? But the big paradox in life is, you will find that most of the time, either we are dwelling in the past, just repenting, oh, why I have done such and such thing for which I am reaping the result now. We are constantly doing that, or we are constantly anticipating the future. Oh, what will happen? What will happen to me? I don't know. And both those things are not in my hand. The thing which is in my hand is my present. I have full control over it. So why waste our time just thinking of the past and the future? So we have to be very aware that where, how our mind is befooling us by constantly wasting our time by either indulging in the past or anticipating the future, which is mere waste of time. Instead of doing that, let us take care of the present. Now the question is, if I don't think of the future, I, how can I have goal? How can I have aim? So again, the question, answer is, yes, we should have some goal. We should have the aim. But once the goal is ascertained, now we have to take care of the minute details at present.
to give a common example, those who just uh, go for mountaineering, for going to the peak, yes, at the very beginning of their expedition, they have a goal, they've decided what the goal is to reach the peak. But very interesting, when they have started their journey, the peak is no more important to them now. Now what they're doing is something, each and every step, now they're very cautious. Now they forget about their goal. The goal they have, they have fixed, but now when the journey starts, they know a little carelessness in each step can be fatal. That will be the end of the journey. So now let us forget about the goal. It has already been ascertained. Now take, let us take care of each and every step. If each and every step now is correct, I am bound to reach the goal. So if I take care of the cause, the effect is waiting there for me. I need not have to constantly think of it. So that's what Swamiji is indicating by that line, that simply, that, but in Karma Yoga, we have simply to do with the word karma as meaning walk. So that was the first idea. And the next idea, which we, uh, in the last class we're dealing with is, that Swamiji in the very first paragraph is indicating to the fact that pleasure is not the goal of the prison, this is of our life. We generally, most of us are befooled by thinking that pleasure is the goal of our life. Pleasure is not the goal of our life. The goal of our life is knowledge. We will find that if we make the pleasure the goal of our life, we will be befooled. Because in the last class, we were discussing that pleasure is the tool of nature to make us do something by which it is sustained. Its purpose is not to really give us any happiness permanently. Because you will find that all our pleasures, which we get by the satisfaction of our ashanas, our desires, the moment I am satisfied, I reach the ecstasy and the very next moment it is gone. It's no more there. And always when I pursue the pleasure, I always think of the peak. I forget about the evaporation. Again, you will find very interesting, in anticipation we get more joy than in really enjoying the thing. Why all those things happen? The nature has actually made happiness the tool to make us do something by which it is sustained. Its goal is not to give us pleasure. And we are constantly being befooled in this life. Our desires, you will find, is never satisfied. We never get ultimate satis satisfaction in life. Once your desire is fulfilled for the time being, you feel satiated, again it comes back. It's an eternal chase. In the words of Swami Vivekananda, ever running, never reaching, nor a distance glimpse of shore. It's this, as if we are in a hedonistic treadmill. You know, in the gym, the treadmill, you run on it, you go nowhere. In the same place, you go on running. In our life, our pursuit for pleasure is something like that. We go on just aspiring to fulfill our desires. We find we reach nowhere. We just go on with it. The eternal dissatisfaction is always there. That's why when Buddha told the first Arya Satya is that there is Dukkha. And most of us by mistake translate it as there is suffering. And many say Buddha, Buddhist philosophy is pessimistic, but that's the wrong way of translating the word Dukkha. The word Dukkha doesn't mean suffering. The word Dukkha really means dissatisfaction. Now there's a difference between suffering and dissatisfaction. You may say no, both are same, both are not same. Suppose when you are enjoying the delicacy which you like most, someone asks, are you suffering? You will say, no, I'm enjoying. How can it be suffering? But the next question, 
are you satisfied? And immediately I find there's a big question mark in my mind. What is the question mark? That most probably I have already developed the craving for the second serving. So though I'm enjoying, whether I'm satisfied is a big question mark. So that's the Dukkha is dissatisfaction. So in this life, if you try to find out the nature of all the happiness, we are never satisfied. We will be enjoying. We are maybe not suffering at the present, but we are not satisfied. This eternal craving for something which can never give us satisfaction is what we call the so-called the sensual pleasures of life. And Swamiji at the very beginning, that way warns us that if you try to find out the nature of the pleasures and happiness, you will find they all come to end. The goal of life can never be the pleasure. It is the knowledge. Pain and pleasure are like the hammer, which is used to chisel our, the shape, the destiny, which we have thought of. You know, a huge monolith is there and you want to suppose make the statue of a lion. So what I do, I go on chiseling out what is not the lion. And from that huge monolith, the statue of the lion comes out. It was hidden there. It was not something which I have brought from some external source. It was there in the monolith. What I did, I just chiseled out what was not the lion. And the lion comes out as a beautiful statue from that monolith. So happiness and pleasure in that way is not the goal. They are meant to chisel out our character. It gives the knowledge. This pleasure and pain is the source of knowledge. The various experiences gives us the knowledge and that knowledge in turn gradually creates a tendency in our mind, a bent of mind. And that bent of mind, that tendency, when again and again pursued, it forms the character. To give a common example, you know, life, it's a very common thing that uh, when we are young, then in our pursuit for the pleasures, we find that we develop so many wrong habits as for our food habits, junk foods and all we take. After a certain stage, we develop some health conditions by the middle age. Now the knowledge dawns in that the food habit which I had, the lifestyle which I had, I thought it to be very pleasurable, but now I find that it is not doing ultimately any good to me. So this knowledge dawns. And now I, this, I understand that I have to change my lifestyle. I have to have good food habits, good healthy habits, good hygienic habits. And then that becomes my tendency. I, though at the beginning I have to use my will, my old tendencies try to just take me away, drag me away again to that old ways of life. But by constant use of my will, of that after I have that knowledge that it is not going to do any good to me, I just go on chiseling with the tendency. And at last we will find, after some time what has happened, there is no need to use the willpower. That chiseling has created a path in my mind. This new way has become a new tendency and that forms my character. And that's what Swamiji is indicating, that all the pleasure and pain at last is there to chisel out the unwanted uh, faculties, the unwanted uh, traits of our life, so that the thing which we desire, the destiny which we see, something which is going to be worthwhile, that comes out. And that's the character which Swamiji has been indicating in, uh, in the first paragraph. So as we have already seen, that in the, even in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, you will find that at the very uh, young age, he realized that the two main uh, hurdles in the spiritual path is lust and gold. Very interesting, okay. Now he thought of renouncing them totally. And his renunciation was so total, so perfect, that, you know, the gold means the coin, the wealth, are at last some coins represent that wealth. So anything metal represents the wealth. 
so he couldn't touch metal as he have rejected them totally and it so happened in the later stages of his life even unknowingly if he touches some metal his hand will ripple immediately his body will ripple immediately and he will feel as if he has been stung by a scorpion and narendranath the young swami vivekananda is a proof to that fact he he, he has actually verified that he wanted to test ramakrishna hidingly he kept some coin in his bed and he was just conspiringly just watching him from so from a hidden place from behind the curtain and he saw his reaction that he jumped up from the bed though he did have never seen the coin just the touch make him jump out of from the bed as if he has been stung by a scorpion and seeing that naren understood that this is character it is not just having the some academic knowledge that knowledge should become your nervous association by constantly pursuing that knowledge it should become your nervous association your body your nerves should just respond to it just the way our reflex action works when we are sleeping something hot touches my body i don't have to decide with my conscious mind that my hand should be rippled the reflex works my hand is rippled without taking any conscious decision because that has become the reflex by constantly thinking of protecting my body it has got converted the consciousness has got converted into reflex and that's the real education unless the ideas become our nervous association it becomes a part of our nerve part of our system it have, unless we have internalized that never speaks of character in the words of ramakrishna very very strongly he used to say the modern education what is the modern education is like it's with all our degrees and qualifications at last what's our condition is like sri ramakrishna used to say that our condition is like a vulture why is saying that he say very nicely the vulture soars very high up in the sky but constantly its focus is on some carrion some dead flesh in the dungeon down in the ground though it is flying very high it is always intent to pick up some rotten flesh from the dungeon so he says that sometimes our education unless we know how to internalize it just remains an academic knowledge without proper internalization it never forms our character and though with all our qualifications we may soar very high in the present day that's the biggest problem those who are holding the responsible positions in the society as the character hasn't been formed sometimes we find that the responsibility which they are supposed to handle is not they are not handling properly and that's why we find so much of chaos in the social structure it happens why because all of our knowledge has not resulted in the formation of the character and here swami is saying so pleasure is not the goal of life from all the pleasure and pain at last we should have the proper knowledge as swami sharadananda used to say very nicely what is life it is nothing but a chain of experiences and what is the aim of life very nicely is to say to learn from those experiences we don't learn that's the biggest problem we go through the same experiences again and again we don't learn in the words of ramakrishna the camel feeds on thorny bushes it bleats but again it will go and resort to the thorny bushes that's what we do if we learn from the experiences we would have been a totally reformed transformed person and that's the goal of our life to form the character by learning from the pleasure and pain which we experience in our life not to get stuck up in the pleasure we will be then befooled so that was the first paragraph and they ended the first paragraph with the idea in your life uh, the pleasure and pain both has the uh, function how they are they how they are effective they help in forming our character but last the last line he told but we will find it is a misery that teaches us more than happiness and that's what you will find all the classic spiritual classics you will find it's a misery which is the source of all the spiritual classics in our you will find the bhagavad gita it is the arjuna's despondency the crisis when he's supposed to act 
with certain responsibility, a big crisis, a moral crisis dawns in and there Krishna comes in rescue. And with that teaching is the Bhagavad Gita. In the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the one, the master Mahasaya, M in that name, this acronym, M, the one who wrote the gospel of Ramakrishna, if you go to the source, you will find a very interesting thing that Master Mahasaya, Mahindranath, was going through some struggles in life. There were some family problems. And it was so intense that he was actually contemplating a suicide. And that's the point when he was having no meaning. He, was, he found that life appeared to be meaningless, as if it has no purpose. That's the time when he arrives at the Shineshwar. And we find the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is the fruit of that despair of Mahindranath. If you re read Ramayana, the Valmiki, the Valmiki also went through some, he was a, a robber. And when he was asked that for whom you're robbing, for the family, is the family going to share your sin, what you're doing? He, he was very confident. Yes, they all love me. Why shouldn't they share? I provide them with the food. I provide them with the sustenance. And obviously they have to share what I'm doing. And he was asked, you go and ask them. And he found no one that is ready to just share the misdoings which he is doing. That yes, it is your work to provide food for us, provide shelter for us. How you do it, it's your responsibility. We are in no way going to share with that. And then that, that the Valmiki, uh, had that realization that no one is there actually to really uh, be called your own. They're all there for some selfish end. And that's the realization which took Valmiki to, into some deep contemplation. And when he comes out, he comes out with that, uh, that uh, you know, that the power to just create poetry by seeing the suffering by seeing suffering, and that's the, uh, from that, the Ramayana ensues. Everywhere we will find, even in the Bhagavatam, the same thing, Parikshit, when he knows only seven days time is there. He's a Mumushu, life may end any time. It's his, Parikshit is lucky, he knew that for just seven days time is there. For us, we don't know when we are going to die, but we behave in such a way as if we are going to live eternally. At least Parikshit got the time. We knew that in seven days he's going to die. And that crisis actually resulted in the inquisitiveness from which the Bhagavatam is the product. So you see all the scriptures comes from the great crisis. When we are in the, when we are, we are traveling through the life and we come to a precipice, we know we cannot proceed anymore. Then we try to find answer in some other dimension of existence. As in the last class, we ended with that example that in the life most probably what happens we don't ultimately find so many answers in our life why because we always resort to our sensual dimension of existence there is another dimension of existence unless you resort to that you can never get the answers to your life's questions that example which we were citing in the last class very nice example i like it very much that in a classroom a teacher Ask the students. It's a question. What's the question? By joining four points, can you draw exactly four triangles? By joining four points, can you draw four triangles? The students tried their best. No one could find the solution. You can never find. It. You try, you will find somewhere or other two lines will intersect to create the fifth point. Just by joining four points without intersection of the line, you can never draw four triangles, exactly four triangles. Then the teacher, when he found that no one has the solution, then he spotted three dots in the blackboard, in the blackboard, and then he asked the students to imagine the fourth point in the space. Now you join the three points in the blackboard, you get one triangle. And from each of the points, now imagine a line to the point in the space. You will get a triangular pyramid with three triangles in the space and one triangle in the blackboard surface. 
So now you exactly get. Then the teacher told her why you were not getting the answer. Because you were only thinking of finding the answer in the two dimension of your page. Unless you take the third dimension, the height, the space, you can never find that answer. And that's what happens in our life. At the moment of crisis, when we find there's no answer to the life, actually that opens up the portal, the vista, to be aware of another dimension of existence. And then we start to find the answers to so many questions of life. The new knowledge dawns in, and that creates some new tendencies. And that gradually speaks of our spiritual evolution by the formation of a totally transformed character. And with that, the first paragraph ends. Now, we will just proceed with the discussion uh, on that chapter from the second par paragraph. So now let us go to the reading uh, uh, a little and then we will resort to the discussion. Now this knowledge again is inherent in man. No knowledge comes from outside. It is all inside. What we say a man knows should in strict psychological language be what he discovers or unveils. What a man learns is really what he discovers. By taking the cover off his soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. So it's again, it's as we mentioned in the last class, that Swami Vivekananda, when he's speaking, the entire Upanishadic teachings, the Vedic scripture is in the background of his mind. And for him, it was a great challenge being the first pioneer preacher, the foremost pioneer preacher of preaching Vedanta to the West. The biggest challenge was to translate the ideas in the Vedic scriptures, which were originally in Sanskrit to English. Before him, no one has done that. The entire uh, Vedic knowledge, which he has presented to the Western audience that he was doing for the first time. And each and every moment, the big challenge was to translate those ideas into some foreign language. And we find Swami Vivekananda is doing it marvelously. Here, just a small paragraph, you will find in Vedanta, the idea is, sometimes we find it's a very peculiar idea that how we get knowledge, just suppose the red flower is there outside, we think the red flower is something, a substantial entity, something outside. It enters our eyes, it touches our eyes, and then we have the knowledge of the thing which is really there. But Vedanta we will find, even if you read Vedanta Sada, they say very interesting thing. How, what's the way of having any knowledge? There's a term called Tula Agyana that each and every object we perceive, and after perceiving, we get the knowledge of it. There is as if a covering of ignorance around it. The, our dear nature, which is consciousness, it comes out, the consciousness as if comes out through the mind and the senses, and then removes the tula agyana, the ignorance covering that object, and then the consciousness envelops that object, and the knowledge of it is revealed. Even I, as a student of Vedanta at the very beginning, I thought it's something very, very queer idea. How can it be? Something coming from inside, removing the ignorance outside, and the knowledge is gained. The flower is there, I see it. And uh, from the perception, the knowledge comes. It is something from as if from without to within, not from within to without. But if you really study the neurological science, in the modern science has developed to a great extent. You'll find that what Vedanta is saying is actually the exact thing which the modern neurology will say. We need not go to the very, uh, what is the intricacy of neurology. Even a very simple example, you will understand that when I'm seeing the red flower, how, what I am doing actually. You know, very interesting, even Newton knew that there is no color outside in the world. There's no color. It is all various wavelengths of light, which actually, if you just take it as an object, there is no as such color there. That 
light falls on the flower, all the wavelengths are absorbed, a particular wavelength is reflected back, it comes and strikes your eye. The function of light stops there. The moment it touches your eye, the light doesn't enter your brain. If you imagine yourself sitting in the brain, it is the darkest corner of your body. No light enters there. The moment the light touches your eye, the retina, it gets converted into some optical nervous sensation. It's something like electricity, which is passing through your optic nerve. And that nerve is not light. It is a nervous sensation which is going to your brain, to the so-called color perception center. And that particular vibration of that optical nerve, nervous sensation, is thrown out as the color, as the redness, which comes out and is projected on the flower to give you a sensation of that redness of the flower. So now you will find it's a wonderful idea. All these colors, all this, uh, the words which we pronounce and we hear is actually there in the brain. It's just like the library having all the books you want a book from the library, you go to the librarian and say, this book I want. He will check the accession number, go and pick up the exact book from there and come and present it to you. That's what is happening. The external world is just a suggestion. The knowledge never comes from there. It's just a suggestion that that suggestion is encoded as the nervous current and in a particular vibration, it goes and reaches the various perception centers in the brain, which we wrongly say as perception center. They are actually the projector. They projected the light, they project the sound, everything then comes out, envelops the object, and we say, oh, this is this. All the colors, all the sounds, everything is already there in the mind. It is hidden. External world is a suggestion to remove the darkness and the thing is revealed. There's a very nice story in Buddhism. In Buddhism, they actually deny the reality of the external world. They call it subjective idealism. To explain it, there's a very nice story. You, uh, you will find it very interesting. One of the cousins of Buddha, his name is Aniruddha. You have most probably heard of Aniruddha. Buddha's cousin. So now, because of his some past, uh, some good deeds in the past birth, because of some good karma in the past birth, he was born with a boon, special boon. What is the boon? That whatever material things he desires in this life, it immediately has to be fulfilled. So he's like something like Satya Sankalpa. Whatever he wants, that has to be fulfilled. So now as a small child, we find Aniruddha being, a, being from the royal family. He, every morning as a small child, he comes out of his house from the palace to have some sorts of game with the other children of the royal family. They all have go, get together and they all will be having lots of funs and games. And their mothers knew that they will be busy with the game. So they will be quiet. Uh, they will be outside for quite long hours. So then what they used to do, all each of the children will be accompanied by a servant who will carry the lunch box for them so that whenever they're hungry, the servant is there to feed them. So in the morning, they go out to have the fun with other children and the servants are carrying the lunch box. And as you know, the children sometimes in their games, sometimes they just uh, think of some type of as a part of the game, they just plan, they devise out some sort of gambling. They don't have any money with what to gamble. The only thing they have is the lunch box. They all are carrying that lunch, the servants are carrying the lunch box. So they start gambling with the lunch box, with the piles of bread they have. Now Aniruddha, when he started the game, he started uh, losing. He started losing and one by one, the piles of bread was reducing. At last, there was no bread remaining. And then Aniruddha ordered the servant, go back to my mother and ask her to fill the lunch box. So the servant went back, 
the mother thought most probably my child is very hungry today. So she piles up the lunch box with the bread again. The servant comes back. Aniruddha is so engrossed in that gambling. Again, he continues to play. Again, he starts losing. All the breads are gone. Now, by this time, he's quite hungry. He's really very hungry. Now, for the third time, for the second time, he asks the servant, orders the servant, go back and get a pile of bread. This time, he's really hungry. Now, when the servant goes back, Aniruddha's mother now understands that there must be something wrong. She understands that it is not that a child can really be uh, so hungry to have this uh, two courses of this is the meal, the lunch box is finished. Something mischief is going on. So this time the mother just gives back the empty lunch box to the servant and says, take this and give it to my child and say and just say him that there is no bread. So what to do? The servant is now returning back with that lunch box, empty lunch box. Now very nicely, in Buddhism, very nicely, they're saying that the, all the devas, all the celestial beings, now they are concerned. Why they're concerned? Because Aniruddha has been born with the boon. Whatever he desires, that should be fulfilled. And now he's going with the empty lunch box. So what they do, conspiringly, the servant never came to know. Conspiringly, they fill the lunch box with the celestial breads. Wonderful flavor, good taste, all the celestial breads, they fill, they fill it. Because Aniruddha, whatever he desires, has to be fulfilled. That's the boon with which he has been born. So now when the servant goes back and gives the tiffin box to Aniruddha, saying, as the mother has ordered, just give him and tell no bread, just by mentioning no bread, he gives the lunch box to Aniruddha. Aniruddha opens and finds all the celestial breads. So nice flavor, nice taste. He really enjoys. In short time, it's over. He gives the empty lunch box again to the servant. And now he asks, go back to my mother and ask her to give more no breads. The no bread has become an entity for Aniruddha. It's a wonderful story to explain the idea of this subjective idealism. That the world which we are seeing is being created by us. You know, in uh, Sanskrit, these words are very important. The devas mean celestial beings because the word deva came from divdhatu, that which illumines, that which is illuminated. Now, the celestial beings are illumined beings. So that's why they are called devas. Again, our indriyas, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, they are also called devas because they illumine the world for me. That's why the devas. So what they're actually illumining? These devas, what they're illumining? The empty framework, the empty lunchbox, which is being carried from the nature within. It's an empty lunchbox. It's just a mere framework. These devas, the mind is also an indriya. This is being in association with the conscious principle. This is projecting all the celestial flavors, sight, sound, this puncher. This all the five sensations is being projected from within without. So now you will find that what without is speaking is exactly what the present neurological science says. So all the knowledge is within. The external world is just a suggestion to bring out all those, just the way you go to the librarian and as per your order, he brings out the book, just following the accessing number. Similarly, all those books, all those ideas, all the sensations are already there in the mind. It's been picked up as per the suggestion. It's been accessed as per the suggestion and it's been projected out on the object to give a sensation that this is red, this is white, this is blue, this is having such and such smell. All those things are a projection of the mind from within to without. So now you will find that when as per our perceptual knowledge is concerned, it is from within to without. There are two types of knowledge. One is perceptual and another is conceptual. Concepts, like the idea of gravitation. That also, from, that also is from within to without. We will come to it. So first you will find that how nicely Swamiji is actually 
with a very simple sentence is translating that Vedic idea and is presenting it in a foreign language in press of the foreign audience, but for the first time is hearing the this Eastern philosophy. And in English, the word discover is also very important. Discover is discover. As if everything is covered with ignorance, you remove that covering. Discover. Remove the cover. Discover. So that's why, how nicely again we read the paragraph, now it will make a wonderful sense. Now, this knowledge again is inherent in man. No knowledge comes from outside. It is all inside. What we say a man knows should in strict psychological language be what he discovers. See this, or unveils, removes the covering, unveils. What a man learns is really what he discovers. By taking the cover off his own soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. Now, one thing, as Swami Vivekananda is presenting the Vedanta philosophy to the Western audience for the first time, there are some words which has various stages of understanding. Here the word soul actually means the mind in association with the real consciousness, the real me in association with the mind. Just the way, the, unless and until you own the computer, the, all the, 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 what you say, the CPU with the hard disk is lying like a dead cell. If suppose just you see that this, uh, the civilization gets destroyed and all these integrated circuits, this IC chips which are inside your computer hard disk, if they are unearthed, they all the civilization gets destroyed, they are all buried in the ground and some, some thousand years later, someone just unearths them. And they will think it is a dead matter, just like, like a dead log wood. They will never have the idea that if electricity passes through that, what a, a world of virtual reality can be created from it. They have no idea. Similarly, the mind, it appears, it actually is like dead matter. It's like that hard disk of the computer. It's like that IC chip, that integrated chip. It's only when that bias world is the consciousness, it comes in association with it, it gets activated. And it also creates this world of virtual reality. The world which we think to be something tangible outside there is actually the projection of the mind, which Swamiji, how nicely, is translating that idea in this paragraph. Now, as we told, at the very beginning, he speaks of the perceptual knowledge. But later we will find that even, what to speak of perceptual knowledge, even the conceptual knowledge, like gravitation, I cannot see, it is a concept. How that conceptual knowledge comes, that also comes from within. That example he will give again in the next paragraph. So why he's bringing out this knowledge? Just to prove that knowledge is something inherent in man. Pleasure and pain, which we were speaking of in the first paragraph, is there to just give the blow for the correct knowledge to come out. And with that knowledge, we start just creating our destiny in more evolved ways. So let's go to the next paragraph. <clears throat> we say Newton discovered gravitation. Was it sitting anywhere in a corner waiting for him? It was in his own mind. The time came and he found it out. All knowledge <clears throat> that the world has ever received comes from the mind. The infinite library of the universe is in your own mind. The external world is simply the suggestion, <clears throat> the occasion, which sets you to study your own mind. But the object of your study is always your own mind. The falling of an apple <clears throat> gave the suggestion to Newton and he studied his own mind. He rearranged all the previous links of thought in his mind and discovered a new link among them, <coughs> which we call the law of gravitation. It was not in the apple, nor in anything in the center of the earth. 
So here we find he's speaking of the conceptual knowledge that also how it comes from within. Uh, how it comes from within. Do you know very interesting that all the ideas are there in our mind, how the conceptual knowledge comes, now, which idea links up with some other idea and as if like the riveted joint, it just clogs in and then some new revelation comes. Very interesting, when we are focused, when we are seeing at something that gives the perceptual knowledge, we are gathering the information and how we get the conceptual knowledge, all the information which I've already gathered. Now, when I am, when I am already, uh, what you say that I'm just relaxed or even I'm in sleep, don't we shouldn't think that the mind is now just doing nothing. That's the time when the mind is not focused. When it is focused, it has the perceptual knowledge. When it is relaxed, it is also required. Then all the knowledge which you have already gathered in, they go on processing. And most of the time, it ends up in fantasies, in imaginations, which has no use in our life. To give a common example, in dream, it happens. In our wakeful state, we had the idea of mountain. We have seen mountain. In our wakeful state, we have seen gold. The idea of mountain, the idea of gold is there in my mind. In dream, it may so happen, I may see a mountain made of gold. In, uh, in our day-to-day -day life, you can never, you will never see a mountain made of gold, but in dream, it can happen. What has happened? One idea has tagged in with some other idea, which actually is never, seen never possible. So that's why we call it dream, it's fantasy. So when we give this uh, relax, we give a free rein to our mind, 90% thoughts are fantasy. But know it for certain, in our life, all the great discoveries come through this process. Of all those wrong connections, a few connections can be wonderful. Suddenly it can give a tremendous leap to our knowledge. The correct, just the, for the Newton, what happened? The falling of the apple, we all see. That apple all, whenever we the apple, it falls, it never goes up. This generalization is in our mind. But for Newton, those ideas clogged in, in such a way, <clears throat> instead of fantasy, it gave the correct knowledge of gravitation. So again here, it's just the rearrangement of the already the available fund of knowledge which is within. It's not something you are getting from outside. <clears throat> so that's why this line is very important. Newton rearranged all the previous links of thought in his mind and discovered a new link among them, which we call the law of gravitation. It was not in the apple, nor in anything in the center of the earth. It came from his mind. So both the perceptual knowledge as well as the conceptual knowledge <coughs> is the product of something which is coming from within. So with this idea, now Swamiji will proceed. All knowledge, therefore, secular or spiritual, <coughs> is in the human mind. In many cases, it is not discovered, but remains covered. And when the covering is being slowly taken off, we say we are learning. And the advance of knowledge is made by the advance of this process of uncovering. The man from whom this well is being lifted is the more knowing man and the man upon whom it lies thick is ignorant. And the man from whom it has entirely gone is all knowing omniscient. There have been omniscient men and I believe there will be yet and that there will be myriads of them in the cycles to come. Like fire in a piece of flint, knowledge exists in the mind. Suggestion is the friction which brings it out. So with all our feelings and action, our tears and our smiles, our joys and our griefs, our weeping and our laughter, our curses and our blessings, 
our praises and our blames. Every one of these we may find if we calmly study our own selves to have been brought out from within ourselves by so many blows. The result is what we are. All these blows taken together are called karma, work, action. Every mental and physical blow that is given to the soul by which, as it were, fire is struck from it and by which its own power and knowledge are discovered is karma. This word being used in its widest sense because we all are doing karma all the time. I'm talking to you, that is karma. You are listening, that is karma. We breathe, that is karma. We walk, karma. Everything we do, we do physical or mental is karma and it leaves its mark on us. So how nicely Swami Vivekananda will find that all the feelings of pleasure, pain, our joys, the weeping, laughter, the curses, blessings, everything is like a blow. They by themselves have no ultimate purpose. They're just there as a means to give us blow, to chisel out the character which results from the knowledge that ensues from all those blows. This, all those blow is actually rearranging the already available fund of knowledge in our mind to give a new course of knowledge. Just the way already available fund of knowledge which was there in the Newton's mind by proper rearrangement, he, get, he got the idea of gravitation. Similarly, in our day-to-day -day life, there's all, there are some eternal principles which we can never uh, deny. But it takes time through the experiences of life to understand, to really realize that. That's why the experiences of life plays a great role. We have to go through those experiences to get matured enough to get the real knowledge. Sometimes the knowledge which we have is not the real one. In English, they say little learning is a dangerous thing. And that's what happens in our life again and again. All our learning are little learning till that ignorance is gone totally and we have the knowledge in totality. We can, that knowledge can never be the saving factor. Uh, today's class, we will uh, end with a wonderful Sanskrit couplet, which our Swami Ranganathan used to uh, quote again and again in, in many of his lectures, in many of his classes. It's a wonderful uh, couplet, Sanskrit couplet. It speaks of the process of learning. That what are the various uh, stages which we go through in the process of learning? So they say there are four stages. There are four ways we learn. What are they? The first is Acharyat Padam Adhyat. That we are sitting in a class as a small child, the parents are there, my father, my mother, my teacher. From them, I get the instructions. They come as, as if the knowledge. So, Acharya, but that is just one fourth. What the Acharya is teaching you is just one fourth. Acharya Padam Adhyat. What is the remaining three fourth? Another one fourth. Padam Shishya Samedhaya. Next one fourth is our intellect. You will find a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, in a class, there are 10 students. All are not, all are not comprehending the uh, instruction which is given by the teacher in the same way. How much I am focused, how sharp is my intellect, on that depends how much knowledge I gather in from the same instruction. So first half, first one foot comes from the knowledge imparted by the teacher. Next one fourth, my intellect is the factor. The next one fourth, Padam Sa Brahmachari Pya. So it's something which has been realized in the present education system very much. That's peer learning. That after the teacher has left, something I have understood well, something the other student have understood well, we will discuss. And through the discussion, we find that the things which was not very clear to me, that it gets more revealed. 
that's why all the formation of the peer groups if you go to the modern classroom it's very interesting previously we used to face the teachers now you will find the groups are there is sitting all around the table they're not facing the teacher they're the peer groups that what the teacher is instructing on that they are again cogitating collectively through group discussion so that's the next one fourth padam sa brahmachari bhya to the all the brahmacharis this all the students they discuss among each other there's a group discussion then the more knowledge is revealed so first one fourth was acharya second one fourth was intellect third peer group discussion through interaction the last one fourth is very important which is being spoken of here padam kala kramena cha with the passage of time with all the experiences which we have we are getting seasoned by the experiences of life and then that another one fourth knowledge is revealed sometimes you will find that as a small child we constantly are get irritated by our parents because they constantly instructing us to do this don't do that and sometimes we feel so irritated that they are as if there is no space in my life constantly they are there to instruct me this or that and that's the time when we were very agitated but we really realize its value when we grow old then we started then we start giving value to those words oh my parents told this thing so much pertinent it is with the so much of sublime ideas it has we realize much later we required the seasoning through the experiences of life to realize those words so that's the last one for and that's what swami is speaking of here the pleasure and pain everything is actually helping in rearranging all the this modules of ideas which is already there in the mind to reveal something which is true but which was not yet revealed which was well the veil is gone the new knowledge comes in and that gives me a new direction which opens up the vista and my character is formed by following the vista the new tendencies are developed and accordingly the character is formed so how nicely swami ji will find is gradually taking us that with each and every action in our life nothing goes west nothing goes west each and every action of life slowly and slowly is forming our character and how this each and every action is important in our life why how we should take care of the small small things of our life so that it actually helps up in having a cumulative effect which is will be returned as my character that again swami ji will be dealing in the next paragraph which again we will uh, pick up in the next class so with this we stop our discussion now we can have uh, just i am just unmuting you all if uh, if you have any question uh, uh, please please uh, we can have for some 15 minutes some interactive session Maharaj uh, Shumon and Ashwin from Sydney. Ah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yes. So thank you very much, Maharaj. It was a fantastic coverage as usual. Uh, we are really blessed. Uh, uh, one of the things that you know constantly strikes me is that you know we have these wonderful classes and. Uh, and you know gurus like you simplify it for us uh, but the moment the class ends and we are out in the world we are pretty much back to square one you know we are back in facebook you know displaying our lives uh, on whatsapp you know trying to uh, show you know what all we have done so anyway we are you know again you know very quickly back again we we come back on a sunday and you again simplify it for us and it becomes so uh, you know again sounds very simple sounds so nice 
but when we go back again, you know, we are, I mean, I shouldn't use the word we, at least quite a few of us go back to square one. So how do we, how do we really, as you're saying, you know, make this a part of our nervous system? Yeah. Should it, you know, should it be slightly more prescriptive, you know, that, you know, maybe we, this week, let us try doing something like this. Yeah. I, I don't uh, have the what, answer. Uh, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a good question. It's a very good question. What happens, you know, that in our life, uh, unless the sense of necessity develops, it develops by the very gradual awareness of it. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a very nice example. You know, what's our mind like? Our mind is like, uh, used to say very interesting, our mind is like uh, the this cum covered pond of uh, the village. In the olden days in the village, the pond, the, the, the village pond used to be covered with a scum. But that's the water the villagers used for their day to day life. A village lady will come to use that water. What she will do, she will remove the scum. She will remove the scum, the clear water comes out. She will use that water for cleaning the utensils or whatever it may be. And it doesn't take even five minutes. Once her work is over, she is now back to her home. Now, in that, uh, just by the side of the pond where she has cleared off the scum, it takes it doesn't take even five minutes for the scum again to come back and clear the and just cover the pond again. So, what a nice example Ramakrishna is giving that that's the condition of our mind. Then, what's the way out? You will find Totapuri, Ramakrishna's guru. He is giving a very nice example. He's saying that the brass utensil has to be cleansed every day. Otherwise, the coating forms, the shine will go. And that's what actually, that uh, it's very natural that we go back to our this uh, default state. But this, the satsang is meant for that. Again and again, when you do, this cleansing actually helps gradually. Now, when Totapuri told that we have to cleanse the brass vessel again and again to keep it shining, Ramakrishna responded in a wonderful way. He told, what if the brass gets converted to gold? So you know this, this is a wonderful answer. Once it's gold, there is no question of uh, cleansing it every day, polishing it every day. It doesn't lose its shine. So this, all these little effects, this our, though we go back to the default, because that's our uh, subconscious mind is, it's already loaded with all those uh, uh, previous tendencies. It's not easy to come out of it. It has a tremendous power. But all these small, our, these attempts, satsangs, though in an unperceptible way, it helps. How it helps, you know? You know how the Shivalinga is formed? A very coarse rock lying in the bed of the river. Water is flowing. At any point of time you go, you see no change. You see no change. Something liquid like water flowing over that rock with all curved surfaces, with all rough surface, there's immediately you see no change. But in hundreds of years, all its angularities are smoothened and it gets, it forms into Shiva Linga. And now that becomes an object of your worship. But when it happened, I've never seen at a certain point of time, no change was visible, but unperceptibly the change was there. So there lies the effect of all this satsanga. Though it may appear, no change is happening. Change is happening. It takes time. That's why Sri Ramakrishna Swami used to say very Swami Vivekananda used to say an interesting thing. Never think spirituality is like a torrential rain. When the torrential rain is there, I can see the rain is falling, the ground is getting wet, the green, uh, my this lawn is getting wet. I can see it. He says that spiritual growth is never like that. He used to say a very interesting thing. He used to say the spiritual growth is like the falling of the dew drops. It was falling, I have never seen it. After some time I go, I find the ground is wet. When it has fallen, I have not seen. So we shouldn't be disheartened by our again and again going back to the default mode. Let us have that patience and the perseverance to again and again come back. And in whatever little way we try to have these good thoughts, that forms the sanskar. It's unperceptible, but it is forming the character. It is chiseling out the unwanted things very slowly to really form what is being desired. So that's the thing which we can say that uh, that's why this, this our type of discussions do have a great importance in our life, though we again go back to our default mode. 
We need not bother about it. We never learned cycling in the first attempt. We never learned swimming in the first attempt. We never learned walking in the first attempt. It were the failures that which were the pillar of success. So in our spiritual life also, the failures are there, but we never mind it. Whenever it's possible, let us come back. How much is possible? Uh, we just resort to good thoughts, sublime thoughts, and that doesn't go west. It's there helping us to, uh, what you say, that saturate our subconscious mind with it, and gradually it will transform our character. So this, with this, we can just say that, uh, that there, is, there is hope for us. So many years. Yeah. Swamiji Raghu here, um, yeah, if I may have opportunity to ask one question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for a um, very nice talk. Um, I would like to start with that. And um, a, as you mentioned that all the knowledge is in mind, it's very true. All the knowledge that is personalized um, is in mind because millions and millions of books has been written. All knowledge, like it's out there, but we can't until we understand it, internalize it, it's not ours. So probably just reinforces the same thing. Same thing is the Newton as well. Like the things were there already. He connected the dots and um, you yeah, know yeah. put it as a law of gravitation. Yeah. Uh, but more important question is like um, that there is so much. Uh, like you know there are billions of neurons in mind, and you can connect it in so many possible ways, and you can learn a lot of different things depending on one's interest. Um, but if we, if we assume that if we have no limitation, what are the key things or most important things you would learn in life? Uh, because like uh, the opportunities are endless um, yeah. of learning. So if you have to prioritize, what would be the key things that one must learn in life? Let's say. So all the experiences at like knowing everything doesn't mean to know everything in details. So I will give a common example. What actually this all knowingness means is very interesting. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean everything knowing everything in details. I will give an example. That in Vedanta they resort to this example again and again. In a rope is lying on the ground in the twilight hours because of the because there is not there is no sufficient light. I see it as a snake. Now as long as I see it as a snake, what's the length of the snake? What are uh, what type of snake it is? What uh, are its uh, what, what is its texture? What is its body color? All those questions have meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the one, the moment that you understand that actually it was an illusion, it is a rope, it is not the snake. Then do do all those details have any meaning? Mm -hmm. It is no. It is the, when I, that ignorance is gone. That what snake is it? Whether it is poisonous or not, it has no meaning because it is not a snake at all. The omniscience in spiritual sense is that when at last you find that the, everything is projected by the mind, it is not a reality out there, then how to just be detached from it? Mm -hmm. How to be detached from it? And that's the entire Karma Yoga. So once you get detached from it, because if that thing is all, the, what you see is the combination of various of your dots, and all those dots are the projection of the mind, then that which is not the real me, then why not take this in a very detached sense that the happenings of the life, as in the last class also we were indicating, sometimes we have no control over it. But what we can do, we can get detached from it, that they can they don't create any effect. They just don't affect my day-to-day uh, -day, uh, living. So that's the pertinent point. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, very interesting thing. When you know that when the mother is cooking the rice and to know whether the rice has been cooked or not, she will just take out one rice and press it between the fingers. And if she finds she is very soft, she knows all the rice has been cooked. She doesn't have to, she need not have to pick out rice one by one, each and every rice, just one. So similarly, in our day-to-day -day life, once that realization comes, that what I see is a projection of mind. It, as such, it has no reality. It's a flow. Then our ignorance for all the thing vanishes. In what sense? There is no, that all the, uh, when the question of attachment comes, when the sense of reality is there, when I know it's everything is fl flowing, it's not real. The real thing is the me alone. Then this detachment comes. 
then just like a small child who is enjoying that, you know, that a, a, a virtual, the world of virtual reality, there is violence, there is something to, to scare, but the child enjoys it. Why it enjoys it? Because it knows after it's a, something virtual, it is not real. So in spiritual life, that's the thing happens. The world remains as it is. The moment the idea comes after it's a virtual, it's a flow. All the, our suffering, our uh, thrill, everything vanishes. We transcend that. We can enjoy it in the real sense, just the way a small child is enjoying the world of virtual reality. And that actually speaks of the omniscience. We will deal with it again. In the next class also it will come. So that's the all-knowingness which has been spoken of. It's not to know one by one thing in details. That way we can never, that there can be never end of knowing. That way there can be never end of yep. knowing. So the real Namaskar. thing is that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar, Namaskar Swamiji Nidhi here. Huh? My question is uh, related to the question we previously asked. Yeah. Like things happen gradually. We can't see it in one day. But mm -hmm. my question is, how does our Sankalpa Shakti, which means our determination, impacts uh, speeding up the things? Like for me, mm -hmm. if I determine, I set a goal, but I feel that the determination, there is a difference between the way we, uh, you know, perceive that goal and how determined we are. So the Sankalpa we make, it should mm -hmm. be really powerful. So how can we intensify that? Uh, that's the thing we were saying that in that uh, sankalpa is generally is very weak. Uh, in Yoga Sutra, it is there. Sarvarthata. Already the mind, the subconscious mind is very strong. It's already your your previous sanskaras are very strong. The mind gets affected in two ways. Just think the mind as a lake. Anything if you're spilting a stone on it, that disturbs the lake. So anything coming from outside as a suggestion that that agitates the mind and anything which is bubbles from the bottom that again also disturbs the surface now this subconscious my uh, thoughts are like the bubbles they're constantly bubbling our conscious thought is very feeble again and again we fail but here is very in uh, one interesting point here which should be noted that all the things which is there in my subconscious mind how it has gone there sometime in the past i have thought them consciously I have thought them consciously again and again and again, and that's how it has went into my subconscious mind. I have at some time thinking them to be the correct way of life, I have done that. So at certain point, they were just conscious thoughts which gradually has seeped in and has now filling my subconscious mind. Now my conscious thought at present is very weak. It is just I have started thinking in this line. Again and again, I will fail. The subconscious mind will throw it out. But we should know that whatever I think consciously, gradually it seeps in, it becomes subconscious. So in spite of failure, again, you have to do it. We need not go on repenting. As we told, the past is not in our hand. We need not just say, oh, why I have failed? Forget about it. Let the dead bury the dead. Past is past. Today, again, with the renewed energy, I again start. Try it. Again, I feel, again, at each and every attempt, is actually seeping in. It is now saturating your subconscious mind. Very common example, suppose a cup is full of turgid, impure contents. Now, as it is already full of impure content, now you pour water in it, pure water in it. As it is already filled, the cup of water will start overflowing. But a very interesting thing will happen. The turgidity will get diluted. A time will come, all the turgid contents has been spilled out. Now the cup starts getting filled with only pure water. That's how our, our conscious attempt, though it may appear to be failure, is actually helping us to saturate our mind with that. In Yoga Sutra they say, that's how Sarvarthata, the distracted mind, gets converted into Ekagrata, that one-pointed focused thought. So it's a very gradual process. So we shouldn't loosen, to get disheartened by the failures each and every conscious attempt, though it may appear to be failure, which actually is seeping in gradually. And this will, in time, concentrate your mind and uh, saturate your mind and all the other thoughts will be spilled out. And this will become the natural way of thinking, spontaneous way of thinking. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, the one who knows, one who is an expert dancer, 
his or her st st step will never be out of rhythm. They never have false step. What's the idea? When I was learning to dance, when I was, when I learned, when I was just in the process of learning, I had to be very cautious about each and every step because there was a fear I may fall, my step may fall out of rhythm. And when you have already learned, you will find an interesting thing. There are so many distractions, other distractions are there, but your feet never goes out of the rhythm. Spontaneously, you have, as you have become an adept dancer. So Sri Ramakrishna used to use this example. You will find there's the one who is learning the musical instrument. At the beginning, he has to be so cautious about each and every this, uh, fingers she's placing on the string. And later she will find that she, when she's talking, she's playing the music. So that's what, gradually at the beginning, it needs a lot of effort. At last, that becomes the spontaneous. That becomes your nature. That becomes your character. By a slow reformation, your this total inner psyche. So that's what- Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Swamiji, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Uh, Self-preservation is a very basic instinct in man. Yeah. Uh, in all humans, when you're faced with extreme danger, mm -hmm. does that propel um, uncovering the mind of some delusions and you get sudden enlightenment, which you possibly would take a long time to get? Yeah. It, if, if you have a high ideal, it happens. You will see in our scripture, they mention that if you die in Dharma Yudhya, you get immediate realization. Uh, why it happens, how it happens. Uh, when you love something for which you are ready to give up your own life also, or that is, as you are speaking, the crisis has given your own life, you are ready to give it up. Then the realization happens immediately. You know why? Someone asked Ramakrishna, when shall I be free? The answer of Ramakrishna was wonderful. When I cease to be. Okay. Actually, our cause of bondage is a limited sense of I. So all the spiritual practice is to get rid of that I. When you, for some higher ideal, you are immediately even ready to re just relinquish that I for that ideal, that the ideal has become like a small child. The mother is ready to give away her life for the small child she's carrying. Similarly, the ideal has become your child. You nurture it just like a child. And for that, you are even ready to give away your life. And then that realization comes almost instantly. Why? Because I is the cause of bondage. When shall I be free? Ami mukto habu kabe, ami jabe jabe. In the words in the Ram in Bengal, he's saying very nice that I, that sense of limited individuality, is the cause of bondage. The moment it falls off, sometimes the, when my life is in danger, and if I have some higher purpose, if I am terribly attached to life, it will be having a negative effect. But if I have some really high ideal, then it can just, the same occasion can be have a very positive effect. It can immediately take to the realization by immediate, by relinquishing that sense of limited I. I really to the, so that's a way, that's a way by which that realization can come almost immediately. It, uh, it's a way. Thank you, Swamiji. So shall we uh, now uh, to stop to, for Swamiji, today? Yeah, please. Swamiji, this is Priya. Ha. Namaste, Swamiji, this is Priya. I, just, I have a question, but hmm. before I ask the question, I, um, I, I, I want to use two examples to, uh, uh, for the question. So they, they're both based on the last two questions that have been asked. So uh, in terms of the Sankalpa, like, you know, how to strengthen the Sankalpa and also uh, you know, uh, at the time of danger, how the you said, you know, the focus that brings in the realization. Yeah. Uh, in your in your previous uh, classes, um, you've mentioned that it's the like you just now also you mentioned that our limited sense of I, that is what binds us, yeah. and our purpose is to become uh, to come into that universal consciousness. I mean, you know, the become uh, to break this barrier of this limited I. You know, the example of iron feelings that you, feelings that you give that, you know, that uh, so once they're scattered, the charge is scattered. But if you want to really make it into a magnet, then, you know, how so the example that you give all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, I so based, you know, the, that question about Sankalpa, I was thinking, is is there a possibility, 
because for me like for for someone like me i don't have the patience to think that this is a task that i'll be i want to achieve in lifetimes to come it's a sense of i really understand and have that feel. i mean i'm not it's 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 from person to person for personally for myself i feel if it if not now then never if i have all the material all the environment and that that awareness that this needs to be done now if if i don't have that now then that means it's not coming anytime sooner so mm. i start with that that it has to be now if if yeah, i if, understand if, your uh, question you know I, yes. well, so, I, I, yeah so i'll come to the question now i'll yeah. come to the question now yeah. is it possible that when we sit down for meditation we because sometimes when i sit down for not sometimes a lot of times when i sit down for meditation i'm able to break the barrier of the limited i and i'm able to feel that oneness with the universal it happens when i am sitting in meditation though but it's possible and it happens and when i do when that happens it feels like that oneness with the with the whole the whole consciousness and if at that point i mean at that point i just let the bliss flow and i just kind of absorb in that i don't do any sankalpas or stuff but if if we try to break free if we, when we sit down for meditation if we one if we remove those those whatever is hooking on to our consciousness all those attachments which is possible and then once we feel that bliss of universal you know that oneness in that moment if we do a sankalp which i haven't done as yet mm. is that the way to strength like a repetition and for more and more practice of this yeah, it's actually as Will to that what help? happens yeah it's in yeah. Uh, not that uh, realization comes in a flash it's not a yes. our practice is gradual but realization yes. comes in a flash and once the realization comes there is no question of going back to the delusion again as swami no. vivekananda gives that example wonderful that he was a wandering monk was passing through the desert he was very thirsty he was in search of water and suddenly he saw a huge reservoir at a distance he started proceeding towards it and after some time he realized it's a mirage and now swami is saying very interesting that he has that knowledge about mirage he has read about it for the first time he has realized what it is now he says very interesting thing the next day when again i am passing through the desert again i am thirsty again i see the mirror again i see the reservoir it's not that i won't see it but one very interesting thing has happened today yesterday it was dragging me towards it today it has lost the power to drag so if you say that today in the meditation you have a sense of unlimited i or what uh, that the sense that this limited i or beyond that but again in your day to day life if you find that your so called these dualities of life is tormenting you know it for certain that it is not the realization it is something just uh, uh, what you say that constant cogitation of an abstract knowledge which is yet to dawn in as realization once realization happens there is no question of being agitated by the dualities of life anymore huh? so we are in the process this is what is what you are saying it's a good thing that when we are practicing when we are uh, in meditation because of our constant thought in the same thing we feel like as if we have reached but we haven't yet reached once we reach it comes as a realization just the way you see something it is palpable it is something palpably realized and once it happens there is no question of falling back to the ignorance anymore so amiji i would ask for a little more clarification on this in in one of your not one lots of other classes that you've mentioned that realization is also a process like the, i don't know the terms you've used but you've used to Re- realization is not terms. a process realization like comes in stages. a flash as ramakrishna says yeah, that as ramakrishna mentioned that a cave is lying dark for thousands of years and suddenly you go and just strike a match it doesn't take another 1000 years for the darkness to go immediately it gets lightened so realization is a flash what we are speaking of to go to the realization 
as per our sense of necessity some may accelerate the process of cleansing the mind some may do it very slowly it is all the process of cleansing the mind which takes time but when the realization comes it comes in a flash Real, it takes no time for realization realization is a flash what we are doing is cleansing the mind from all the wrong way of understanding that may take time but when the realization comes it comes in a flash so when you mention dhyan dharana and samadhi so yeah. so and then you uh, like in the in the classes in the patanjali yoga sutra so, you mentioned yeah in dhyan patanjali dharana. yoga sutra if you remember then, we mentioned there is a sutra called tivra sanvedana masanna dhyan dharana samadhi is a process but how much yes, time that's what I'm it's a process of cleansing the mind but how much time it will take to cleanse the mind it again depends on your sense of necessity sanskaras are formed in two ways one is repetition of the same thing again and again and second thing the sense of necessity giving you a tremendous focus if you remember the example that when you have out of sense of necessity you have focus uh, today we have taken a lot of time if uh, those who are uh, busy they can uh, uh, go out of the class but uh, yeah let me just answer your question uh, suppose that i will give the two common example two common example you will understand you know that sanskara is formed by repetition but is it only repetition no how much focused you are when you are doing certain thing that also creates a very deep sanskara if you remember we used to give that example suppose god forbid i am on the i am passing through the road i am just driving through the road on a car and suddenly i am about to meet an accident some other car came from the front and it was always about a head on collision and somehow it was averted i was safe nothing happened now you will find throughout your life you will remember the each and every details of that moment it, it becomes as if very slow motion each and every details of that moment when we are about to have a head on collision you will never forget throughout your life it will come as a nightmare even if uh, someone asks you in the old age you will describe it in details you will find even for those who are a patient of dementia some very remarkable incidents in their life in the past they never forget what it speaks of when you are highly focused at that time what happened because of the imminent death our tremendous clinging to the life my mind gets so focused at that time and that's so that focus actually speaks there is no need for repetition it happened only once for a small child to learn the lesson he has to memorize again and again the same thing here only once it happened i never forget so what is the answer that if you are highly focused there is no need for repetition just one act that's why even shankaracharya says in his life if you read very nice he just gives the tarak mantra in his disciples ears and he realized realized because that created tremendous focus they were already prepared for it now the question comes how to have that focus that focus comes again from the sense of necessity at that example again we gave suppose see a person a surgeon is standing in the bus stand for certain reason he has to catch the bus and the bus is delayed he finds his legs are aching okay now the same surgeon who couldn't even bear the half an hour delay of the bus the same surgeon raised him is in the operation theater operating on some patient most probably for 8 hours he is standing and he forgets thirst he forgets hunger he forgets tiredness why because his mind is extremely focused on the age of the scalpel he knows a little mistake will be at the cost of the life of the patient that sense of necessity gave him so much focus he forget all other things so now you link the sense of necessity gives us the focus and the more the focus the lesser is required for repetition of the thing again and again the sanskar gets ingrained and the once the sanskar gets ingrained the immediate that spontaneity comes so now you will find the answer why it is not happening in us because the sense of necessity is not there how but for us what happens spirituality is just something to get rid of the struggles of life you will really understand that the life faces its challenges i want to go to the security zone for the time being and that's why that we resort to spirituality have we ever realized that this life after all has no meaning the spirituality is the thing which has to be realized in this very life if it happens realization comes instantly you will remember the example of ramakrishna one disciple asked the tik guru why i don't have that tremendous earnestness yearning 
Why don't I realize God? The guru didn't answer. He took the disciple that, why don't I realize God? He took him to a nearby pond just to have a dip. And both had the dip together. And the immediately Guru grabbed the disciple by his shoulder and thrusted him inside the water, not allowing him to get up. He was gasping for breath. After some time, he was really, he was feeling that he was going to die. The Guru released him. He came up and now the Guru asked him, how were you feeling? No, I was gasping for breath. I was about to die. Do you feel for the need of God or your realization that way? That necessity will give the focus and realization will come immediately. So that's why Sri Ramakrishna used to say yearning is just like the red hue of the dawn. When in the early morning, in the dawn hours, you see the red hue, the sun is yet to be seen. You don't see the sun. The red hue only see, you know very well, in just a matter of minutes, the sun will be visible. So similarly, Ramakrishna is saying that yearning is the red hue of the dawn. When that real yearning from the sense of purpose, it comes realization comes immediately for others they have to go on through that gradual process of repetition so that's why that sutra is there in the yoga sutra tivra sangveganam asana the more yearning you have the more quick the process is it accelerates it doesn't say, there is no such limitation that how quickly i can i can get it in a flash just the guru says the mantra immediately relation can come if i'm prepared for it otherwise i have to go through this gradual process. That's why even in our scripture, there is, there is mention of two types of sannyasa, vidvat and vividisha. Vividisha is those who are yet to have that sense of purpose, but gradually through practice, they're proceeding. That is vividisha. And vidvat, those who are hearing that spiritual dictum immediately gets the realization. They're already prepared for it. So now I think to a certain extent, you will understand that uh, why we need that time because the sense of purpose is not there. Ramakrishna used to say very nicely, in a sense, we are all atheist. Why? Because so suppose a thief knows very well that the next room which is locked is full of treasure. Can he sit quietly? He will be restless. If you really know the treasure is within you, can we sit quietly? It will make us unrest, forget everything. See the life of Ramakrishna, you read what earnestness is. Just uh, lying on the ground, rubbing his face on the ground because he couldn't realize, one day has passed, he couldn't realize God. So that's why these lives are so important. When you go through that, you find that then you can compare where we are and what they are. That comparison comes. And then we will understand that what actually this earnestness is. And if that real earnestness is there, no need of repetition. You get it immediately. If the cleansing process is done immediately and you are realized immediately. I think... Uh, <laughs> With this, Swamiji, given the class has already extended, probably we can extend a little more and ask a few yeah, more yeah. questions. Okay, okay, please, please. <laughs> because if, if, once we rock, break the rules, we can break a little more. As okay, well. no, for me, it's not a problem. <laughs> it's a, yeah, I, I have now, as uh, there is no other. Uh, is, have, yeah. Thank you, brother. That's uh, a savior for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, um, I think on the realization, what you mentioned was. Um, like, yes, really true, because a lot of time people consider it as a process like running. We are going somewhere and we have to reach somewhere. But if we are realizing ourselves and that's what we are, um, uncovering of stuff, it depends on how cleansed we already are. The more cleansed we are, more quickly we realize. So timing and, uh, you know, all that 